Hey everyone, today we're going to troubleshoot and repair one of these heavy duty chargers. This one is from Centec. Given what they are and the state of affairs inside, we're going to do so without applying power to them, which is much safer given how these break. To illustrate the problems and replicate them for the purpose of this video, I will be applying power through isolation and a variac. Going over this unit specifically right quick. This is a Centec heavy duty charger, 6 and 12 volt item number. 63043 charger between 2 and 40 amps it also starts engines between 100 and 200 amps so it packs a punch especially if you're sticking your hands in there don't be sticking your hands in there when this thing's powered up and i'm assuming there's a catastrophic vent you would just charge it something and boom this thing just has smoke bellowing out of it and probably with good common sense you decide to unplug the power cord and not sit there and wait to see what happens next Maybe you fired it up later, hoping that it healed itself. You heard a loud humming sound inside. You unplugged it again. I'm going to demonstrate that right here, but I'm going to use a Variac just using a fraction of the AC voltage so I don't blow up the transformer. With that in mind, I also have a multimeter connected to the output, and it's set for AC. And there's a reason for that. We'll get to that. And here's my Variac. It's set to zero volts. There's an on-off switch as well, and this is connected to isolation. If you don't know what any of this equipment is and you don't have it, don't work with live voltage. Here we go. There's the hum. Now look at the AC output of what should be DC. See AC output? Not good. Do it again. I would never go full tilt here knowing that there's a problem. It would put way too much strain on the system as well as my test equipment. It's just not going to happen. You also notice even at reduced voltage, the fan doesn't move at all. So we're going to kick off a power off troubleshooting right at the plug, which is good, which means it can't be plugged in. I would like to, however, quickly document my probes, and I will find here that it is 1.4 ohms through the probes. It's good to know as I plug them in across the prongs of the outlet. And this test could be done checking the timer switch both in timer mode and in the hold mode. Both of them should be checked. The volt amp selector should start in the off setting. We should see between 130 and 150 ohms, and that is the resistance of the coil within the fan right here, and that's perfectly normal. If we don't see that, the fan may be burned out or not properly connected. Cycling the volt amp switch, we're going to see different resistance measurements for the different settings. They're only slightly off in the resistance, and you have to take into account the offset that I've already previously documented, so it's actually very little. And we won't see that fan value because it takes a path of least resistance. But this shows all the taps good, connected to that primary winding. We know that if we're going to do any meaningful check of anything at the secondary windings, we're going to have to remove any cables that are connected to it. That means the cable's connected to these rectifiers right here. And I'm not going to be removing them one side. I'm going to be doing a live voltage demonstration in a bit, so I'm going to completely remove these cables. I removed the black cables from this side of the winding for testing as well. It would be difficult to measure an accurate resistance value across the secondary windings to get any reasonable value because the resistance is so low. But what you would be looking for is that you wouldn't have any opens across any of these on the secondary winding. And that's what I'm doing. You should see whatever the resistance is of the cables themselves. If we really wanted to, we could measure this for inductance, but that's beyond the scope of this video. And these harnesses just sit on two positions on the bottom of the coil, and they have three outputs that connect into three diodes right here up top. Same exact thing applies on the other side. And we can see exactly how that's connected. Two to one, two, and three. They're disconnected. I'll fire it up. I'll start rolling up the AC voltage. I reconnected the negative side of the secondary windings for this test, as you see. at 120 volts the fan is spinning there's no hum there's no apparent problem obviously there's no output because nothing's connected to the rectifiers but that's clearly where the problem is from the rectifiers back and my bet is it's the rectifiers so given you had a machine that had the same disposition and you didn't leave the transformer running that it blew up a power off troubleshooting it already had gotten us out of the transformer we knew we were at the rectifiers and now we're able to test them and continue with power off troubleshooting We'll turn our meter to diode to begin our test. Now I'm going to start at the uh, bottom one closest to me. It's just a matter of preference. We can see this one showing 0.456 in this direction. And I'll swap it around the other direction. And we're showing open. From a diode indication, this seems acceptable. Right? 
and I go to the next one, and this is a dead short, definitely not a good sign. I'm going to flip it around just to be thorough, but yeah, this is problematic. That probably killed the whole unit right there. There's probably more of them. We'll find out, right? I'm going to move on to the top one, closest to me. This we're seeing uh, open in this direction. I'll flip it around. And we're seeing 0 0.420. It's not lined up with the other value, but it's acting in the function of diode. So we'll say that's okay. Now we're going to the next row. Open in this direction. Okay. Flip the polarity. And this is 507. Okay. So it's a working diode. And the other one. 423. I'm just going to move it like this is quicker. And this is 415. So all these diodes appear to be working. Their values are all different, but they're working. We'll remove this whole unit and make the necessary repairs. An 8mm will be used first in conjunction with a Phillips screwdriver to remove this top Phillips screw. That's so these wires can be removed from this aluminum panel. After pulling it through, I then take that screw and the nut and I put it back through everything. And screw it back down so I don't lose any of the parts. Two nuts also secure the bottom of the panel too. They're also 8mm, so I loosen those as well. The panel slides right out. The two insulated washers fall down to the bottom. I'm sure to pick those up. Those will be put back on the screw. As I slide the diode away, we could see the uh, witness marks from the failure event. What barely passes rivets will have to be drilled out from this board. There are three of them. It's spring loaded, so I'll have to be sure that it doesn't fly out the other side as I do this. I lift it up and one group was stuck in there. Two of them came out. We could see the silver side of the diodes faces the board and that's important to remember. So third one is now out. I haven't lost any parts, so we're doing pretty good. Here's one that melted. I'm trying to be careful and save the plastic retainer, so I want to get that diode out. And luckily I was able to remove the diode. However, looking inside, I could see that that metal piece has melted into the plastic. So I'm going to have to scrape away some of this in the hopes of getting that metal piece out without damaging anything. I do want to get all these springs out of here, though. They're embedded into these rivets that are stuck in here. It's only a matter of time before I start losing those springs, and they are going to be reused. So I'm going to pull the rivets and springs out from all three of these and just drop everything in an appropriate container because I don't want anything to get lost because that's going to take more time and money to fix this project, and I'm trying to keep everything quick and cheap. This one piece is really putting up a fight. You can see how the heat and the pressure from the spring has embedded it into the plastic. With patience, it did come out. I'll clean up everything, and that'll be it. Close the lid. Nothing's getting lost. Clean this up with some cob cleaner to remove the dielectric grease and dirt and whatnot and see what we're working with. Things are looking better, but there's still more to do. There was some welding that deformed the aluminum a bit, so I'm going to sand it down to ensure that it's flat because we don't want some raised areas that's going to cause resistance in those areas. We're going to make it nice and smooth with some sandpaper, then hit it with a higher grit to smooth it out nice, clean it off and have a look. Now it's nice and smooth, we're ready to go. I'm mixing up some epoxy now to fill in that recess that was caused or we're going to have a bad connection, probably cause another failure. And I'm just putting it in in the recessed area to shore it up and leave it here to dry on an angle, and we should have it all repaired when that's done. So it's been fully dried for a couple days, and it has filled in that recess. The new dyes have arrived, we're gonna go through them. They should be the same size, diameter, and values as the old diodes. We can see right here, they appear to be the same and color, but we're gonna test them anyway. They come in a pack of 10, and I need six, so I wanna get six with the closest characteristics, so I'm gonna measure all of them. That might not be entirely necessary for this job, as they might very well be close enough, but I got them, so there's no reason not to. It's also checking to make sure that all of them are working before we install them. 
and I'm just forming two separate piles. The low one is for the ones that are closely aligned, and the top one is for the ones that are slightly off. So I'm trying to get six closely aligned, which I have, and the top ones will go back into the bag. All the oxidation is being cleaned off of these pieces with the Dremel using one of the wire brushes. They then get a final cleaning with paper towel and cob cleaner. Each of the areas where the diodes will come in contact with on the metal plate will have a small amount of dielectric grease applied to it, very thin. Thin layers also applied to these pieces as well, and the pieces are installed into the plastic in this direction. The diodes are then installed, silver side facing upwards. It's easy to lay the plate onto the diodes so that the diodes don't fall out. There's a small notch that aligns the hole just to the right, and then pressing down to hold everything together, checking that everything's still in place, the spring is dropped in, followed by a screw and a washer of appropriate size and fitment, I put the nut around the other side and give it just a couple turns as to hold everything into place. With the assistance of a pair of pliers, I'm able to turn the nut just a little bit further so it doesn't fly off and have the spring shoot out everywhere. And we can see everything seems to be lined up very nice. We're going to grab a flathead screwdriver now. Holding the nut, turn the flathead screwdriver until the spring compresses at least around flush with the plastic so that it has the diodes tight seated against that metal plate. And that's the first one. We'll test it as installed to make sure it's in the same direction as it was using the polarity of our test set from our previous test in the unit and everything's still in the right direction. We'll proceed in this manner. So now we'll continue onward and install the other two in the same manner. This is done, ready for final testing. ready for installation. So now I'll remove the nuts and insulation material that I left on the transformer, place the unit back in, add the insulation back on, followed by the nuts, after which both of them will be snugged down. This screw nut held all these wires together. The nut will be removed. The screw will then go back through the plate on top here. The nut is reinserted and tightened down. The Phillips and the wrench are used together to tighten down that screw securely. These two black wires will go back in the secondary winding. I install them now, but I notice as they sit in there, they're rather loose. So I pull them back out and I'm gonna just crimp them gently with a pair of pliers so I just get a better bite on it and put it back in. It's not enough, I crimp them again a little bit more so we get a good connection on them. Then I'll do the same thing to the other cable. And with that, I'll actually have to use again the pliers to push it on now that it's a tight fit. The same type of crimping is being done with the connectors on the red cable. Those are a bit loose too, and I'm doing all that crimping before I install them.
I ramped it up from zero to 60 volts, but I didn't have it on video. But I'm adding in my kilowatt so we could see the current live. And we're at 60 volts now. The most important thing on idle is we're only drawing about 130, 140 milliamps. So there's definitely not a problem. We're also seeing four and a half volts DC on the output. And that's at 60 volts half power on the six volts. So the output voltage is correct. Now I'm going through the selector knob, rotating it to the different settings as I look at the voltmeter up front to make sure all the taps are working good. 5.31, 6 6.51, 8.96, 8.99, and off. At this point, I'm ramping it up to full power. If you didn't have a variac, this is where you'd be starting at line voltage, but I'm bringing it up slow. We can see the fan speeding up and a whole bunch of crap being blown out into the camera as it happens. We would expect the voltage to about double from four and a half. So 9.4 is the expected unladen voltage for the six volt charger. It seems to be appropriate. I'm gonna cycle through the other ones now. At full line voltage, take notice of this AC ripple coming off of this unladen power supply. Not nearly as much AC as there was when the rectify was broken. But just take note. And I'm just cycling through all the modes which has some sort of negligible effect on the AC ripple. Now I've got a battery connected. You can see the battery voltage and I'm going to fire up the unit. So we're running on the 12 volt, 2 amp charge setting. We're seeing 13.88 volts on the output. And when we look at the AC component now, we're only seeing less than 300 millivolts, which is significantly less than we saw on the unladen AC component. The current draw from AC mains is just under half an amp at 14 volts on the output DC. Switch it over to 12 volt 10 amp, and we see the current draw goes up to 670 milliamps with an output of 15.21 volts and an AC ripple of under 0.4 volts AC. We switch over now to 12 volt 40 amp, 12 volt 40 and amp. we're pulling 1.44 amps from mains and 17.2 volts DC on the output with a ripple of 0.84 volts AC. And we could see in short time that that ripple does drop. Both meters were found to be fairly accurate during these tests. And that concludes the repair of this Sentec Heavy Duty Charger. I hope you found this video enjoyable, entertaining, and informative. Do me a favor, hit that like button down below. Helps me out a lot when you do. And hit that subscribe button to be informed of more videos like this when they come out. Again, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Would you like to reply?